talked about was creating a jar and how you could write an install program to install that and you know and give someone the jar and they could run it provided they had the Java runtime engine uh, last time we talked about a web-based solutions the big advantage of which is the code runs on the server which means that you do not um, have to worry about deploying it anywhere but on the server and as the chief advantage and we talked about two different technologies that were similar and that sort of get compiled into each other uh, and those technologies were JSP and Java servlets whereas Java servlets are Java classes that output HTML code JSP are HTML page code HTML pages or code that contain Java code embedded within them JSP pages would be very similar to for example PHP pages which some of you might have written uh, before it was similar to old school ASP pages with ASP.net um, there's sort of uh, differences bigger differences between the two uh, we're going to continue the discussion today by just uh, talking about uh, Java beans and talking about maybe a bit about Android development because those are two things that that relate to this Java beans are, are often used in a web context and so what I want to do first is I want to sort of define a Java bean and if you look software developers love their puns and figures of speech and so on so if we were to look at actual coffee beans reggae things to look at Java beans what does that make you think of well, I mean that's a dumb question these are all dumb this is a very dumb question all right because yeah what that made me think of is I could really go for a cup of coffee right now but the you know, chocolate and all that what does the bean what do what 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 do you what do you think of then when you see the bean up there what is sort of the bean focus on a single bean It's brown, okay. What else? Small. It's small, okay. What else? I know never to use this example again. All right. I thought it would be clever, and as it turns out, it's not. Uh, here's the things I think of. All right. What I should have done is I should have like approached someone before this class and like fed them the answers I wanted to give. <laughs> that way, that might have might have worked out better. But what I think of first of all, small I like. It's also self-contained. In other words, theoretically, if I had a big old sack of Java beans, I could go and pull out one of the beans and put another one in without much of a mess. They're not like tangled together. Like, could you imagine if this was, oh, what's something that would be like sticky or whatever, like honey, all right? Like, even if you had like globs of honey that all sort of run together and you couldn't really pull one glob out if without affecting the others and so on I'm, I'm digging myself a deeper and deeper hole but here's the things I want you to get they're self-contained all right there's no like crossover between beans that the bean has a hard shell it's self-contained all the goodness of the bean is inside the bean and being around other beans doesn't affect that it can still make its contribution to the whole even though it's surrounded by other beans and you could easily swap one bean out for another possibly and it's small and coffee you know if you were to grind and make a cup of coffee it's one piece of the total batch of coffee that you're making it's a component sort of a self-contained little component that does its thing 
and you're good to go. And Java beans are similar to that. They're components. Um, I, I found an interesting word when I was doing research on Java beans. And that word was, there's a picture for those of you watching the video that I showed. The word that I found was, the Java beans are basically POJS. What does that mean? That means plain old Java objects. So it's not like a Java bean is something different than a Java object. It's just a certain Java object written sort of following certain conventions and following certain styles of doing things. And the good news is, is for those of you that have been coding classes like I have created classes in this class, the, the conventions aren't terribly different than what we've been doing all along. And that's sort of the good news for this. And that's one of the reasons why I teach the way I do, because it's good standard development. And what this will allow is it will allow some really good benefits. And it will allow you the benefits of creating little components that you can pop into your programs easily. Self-contained, you can pop them in very easily. Um, there's, a, there's a rule in, in some styles of programming that talks about convention over configuration. And what that means is if you follow some simple rules, all right, you can make your life easier instead of writing a bunch of code to configure and to force your application to work a certain way. Ruby on Rails follows that principle. You follow certain conventions, and that just makes, that's sort of one of the, the landmarks of that language, is, is you write code a certain way, and if you follow certain rules or guidelines, it really makes your life easier. Well, here are the rules of a Java bean. And I'll look this up when I'm done just to make sure I didn't forget any off the top of my head. But here are the conventions that you follow when you create a Java bean. You don't inherit a class necessarily. You don't have to. All right. You first of all make sure that your class has a no argument constructor. And when we look at in a minute how a Java bean is used, We'll see how all these things come into play. All right. So we're going to have a no argument constructor right off the bat. So we can, we can say this. My bean m equals new my bean. Which means that maybe you don't write any constructors. Right? Because if you don't write any constructors, then it has a no argu con argument constructor. If you do write other constructors, you include a no argument constructor. All right? Second thing. Could you have an argument and a no argument constructor in it? You just have to have a no argument constructor. If you have other constructors, that's OK. okay. But the rule is that you have a no argument constructor. Second rule. All attributes are private. I will say private slash protected. And we said that since the first time we started developing classes, right? We know that we don't want people, and by people I'm not talking about users, I'm talking about other programmers, to use our classes in a reckless way. All right. So if we have an attribute that was, let's say, a size attribute, the weight of a package, for example, if we had a package class that had a weight as one of its attributes, we want to make that attribute private because then we can control how people set that, how other programmers set that. All right. Because remember, we're not just, uh, just developing classes to solve our own problem. We're developing components that can be used to solve other problems as well. So if we create a package class, we shouldn't say, well, I know not to set it negative, and I won't. Well, you know that, but if other people are use it for other purposes, you don't want them the ability to um, cor corrupt, um, 
compromise, however you want to put the system by being able to put in invalid values. So you make the attribute private. Then people can't manually go in and set the value of that attribute. You have to go in and use a method to do that. All right? So attributes are private or protected. That, uh, that forces people to use the methods to access and manipulate those attributes. So you have to use a set method. And to get the attribute, you have to use the get method. And that's the other rule of a bean, is that you have get and set methods to access and manipulate attributes. Sometimes these things are called accessors and mutators. Things allow you to access, get the value of a property, mutate, or change the value of a property. So let's think of a bean that we might have for students. All right? And it's important to realize that these getters and setters follow a certain format. And again, I didn't formally introduce these as rules for beans. I just described it. But if you've been following it along, you should be doing this anyhow. But let's say we have a simple bean for a student, let's say. Um, another sort of rule is override the to string method. We'll talk about that. So if I was making a bean for a student, it might look like this. Class is student. Back, let's go. Let's go and just create it. In fact, let's go and do it in NetBeans. So let's make a new project. I want to make a Java web project, web application. Next, let's give it a name. I'm going to call it, go use that server, finish. I'm first going to define the bean, and then we're going to include that bean in a GASP page.
I'm going to create a new Java class. The Java class really, a bean is, is a Java class. And I'm going to call it student. And I'll put that in here. I'm going to follow the rules, rules of creating a bean. So my properties are going to be private. Private string name. Private string email. Private String, um, do, do, do. let's say, um, it's like private int student number. And I'll do a private int credit hours. Okay? So, I followed that rule, right? Uh, everything is private. I'll make, uh, actually I'm not going to even make a constructor, right? Because if you don't make a constructor, you have, by definition, a no argument constructor. So I'm going to make gets and sets for all these. So the gets are going to return the value of the property. So I'm going to make a public. What's the return value for get name? Well, it's whatever the property is. Get name is string, so when we get the name, it's going to be a string, because the name is a string. So the get return value is the same as the property of the type. So whatever the type is here, that is the type of the return method, right? Because you're returning that value. The get function should be get followed by the name of the property. And this is where, uh, again, follow convention in Java. In Java, property names are lowercase. So notice name is a lowercase n. Email is a lowercase e. Student number is a lowercase s and a capital N. So the first letter is lowercase. The first letter of each subsequent word is uppercase. And then same thing with credit hours. So my get method is going to be called get property name. My set method is going to be set property name. And again, one slight curveball here is because name is the second word here, I capitalize it. So the property is lowercase n. The get method is uppercase n. This accepts no arguments, right, because the get really doesn't have any arguments. And all it's going to do is return name. And we're going to have the same thing for the other properties. This is just as we've been doing, except we're paying very close attention that we follow the rules, right? We make sure we're returning the right value, which you probably should have always done. But we're making sure we name it right, too. And I can have a public. Again, int, because that's the student number. So the get student number will be a get int, and we'll return to, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't be get email, I should be get student number. I'll change it in a minute.
And then finally, we would have get credit hours, which will return also an int. All right. Yes, to return email. Then I'm going to do my set methods. Now my set methods, again, follow a convention. They're going to be public. They're going to return nothing, right? And they will be set in the name of the property. There will be one argument, and one argument will be the type of whatever the property is. So in the case of name, the name property is a string. So the argument is going to be a string. And then we simply say property equals arg. And we'll have set email, set student number, set credit hours, and that's it, I think. Again, other than us paying really close attention that we have the names correct, this should be no different than what we've been done doing since the first or second week. So we're following those conventions. Now we can have a toString method. What a toString method does is allows us to override the object toString method, which just prints some very basic information about the object. So that will be a public string toString. And I could return something that would identify this object. So maybe I would return. the student number concatenated with the um, name of the student. So I'll return student number plus colon space plus name or something like that. Okay. So that's our bean. Doesn't really look anything different than any object we've created so far. But a couple things about a bean. Number one, we can include this very easily in a JSP page, all right, which we'll do in a minute here. All right? And secondly, we can use this uh, in graphical, many graphical interfaces allow you to just drag and drop beans on a JSP page. Beans offer, because they follow the convention, they offer something called introspection, where beans can actually look inside themselves and tell you what functions that uh, they have. So I'm going to go find, just to start myself off so I don't have to type a lot of stuff, I'm going to find a JSP example, a JSP bean example. Should implement the serializable interface. I forgot that part. Okay, they did almost the same thing here. 
they put it in a class. I'm going to use the JSP uh, example that they use. So I'm going to put this in a package, first of all. Java server pages. Create the package and put it in there. Um, I'll move this guy in there. Okay, so now it's in here. So I'm going to create a new JSP page. And call it new JSP, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to go and I'm going to cut and paste their JSP and I'm just going to adapt it simply because I'm being lazy. So I'm going to create the bean, and we'll see what I mean by creating the bean and all this. And we'll see how the, what I do here maps to the functions in the Java code. So the first thing I do is I use the use bean instruction. And the use bean is effectively making an object from the class. So use bean when I have the statement use bean ID equals students class equals edu Lorraine CCC dot CISS Java blah 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 blah. That's the equivalent of this in Java code. It's the equivalent of saying, first of all, import edu Lorraine CCC CISS Java CISS 226 student. And then saying student S equals new student. So that's what this is the equivalent of. Think of the ID as being like the name of the variable. This is the package and class that we're using. So we're importing that and then we're using that student class. So effectively that's what we're doing. All right. We can then set different properties of that student. So I can say S, 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 set property. What's the property? Name. Email. student number,
So set property is the equivalent of calling the set method for that property. So how does it know? How does Java know what that set method is called for that property? Well, we follow the convention. The set method starts with the word set, and the second part of it is the property name. So if I say set property, and the name of the property is name, and the value is Zara Ali, that's the equivalent of saying s dot set name. Zara Ali. That's the ID of the bean. That is the set property, gets the set part. The name is the property name. And the value gets put here. So we don't have to write complicated Java code. One advantage that JSP does is if a smart Java developer, if a, if a competent Java developer gives even a web designer, someone that doesn't have a lot of experience programming, if you give them a bean to use, by just learning these very simple use bean, set property, get property, they can integrate their web page with a Java bean. Okay? So I set those properties. Again, that's the name of the object. This is the property we're changing, and that's the value. And then I can output this in the middle of my HTML. So I can say, I want to make maybe a list that shows all the information about this student. So I use the get property. And that will output the name of the property. And what's the property name? And I can do it for email. And student number. OK. Then I can run this file. And you'll see how I'll create that bean. And the output from this page will be HTML code that contains the values that I set that bean with. All right, it's doing all its thing. It's compiling everything. Because remember, these JSPs get compiled into Java servlets. So it's compiling my bean, compiling my JSP page, doing, it th doing its thing. And finally, when it's done, it's going to create the web page. It's so using that glass, glass fish development server that is included as part of NetBeans. There's the browser. And drum roll, please. Oops. There is my web page. So these are I created my Java class. I set the values of the properties. I then created a web page that got the properties of those things. Okay, this is an earth shattering. Uh, in a real example, when you create the bean, one of the things that you might do is actually retrieve data from it. 
All right. You can also through you can also include regular Java-like statements in here. You don't have to use the bean, but the bean. Notice how easy that is. Uh, including Java code in JSP pages is something like this. So, in this example, notice I have the, can use that syntax to um, indicate I'm in Java, and then I can include any Java statements I want to. So, if I had other functions, I could do it that way. But notice how straightforward the bean notation is. Now, I could almost fake the system to treat something that's calculated like it was a property just by giving it a get method. All right? So if I give it a get method and no set method, that's kind of a read-only property. Right? Uh, and if I give it a set method and no get method, I can, that's kind of a write-only property. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want a tuition calculation. And I'm not going to do the tuition calculation like we did for LC that was complicated. I'm just going to say that your tuition is um, um, $200 a credit hour, let's say. So I'm going to create a public double get tuition even though there's not really a property called tuition. I'm going to fake beans in the thinking that, it, that there is. And I'm simply going to say return credit hours times 200 or something like that. So now in my JSP, I'm going to set the credit hours using the set property JSP instruction. Let's say they take 12, 13 credit hours. And then I'm going to sort of fake it and say, all right, get the t property called tuition. What that's really doing is that's looking for the get method. So it will call the get method, do the calculation, and return the result. So even though tuition isn't really a property, we can get it kind of to act like one. And there we go. Their tuition is $2,600, which is the 200 times the 13 credit hours. All right. So Java beans work well and make uh, and sort of simplify the act of uh, creating JSP pages because they're neat little components. And because we followed rules in defining them, they're really easy to use. And beans can also be used in uh, a drag and drop way in many uh, GUI tools. All right. Um, I will post this example, because this is almost the same. No, I will not post this example. I will post this example, because this is almost the same example that I did. I just tweaked mine a little bit. Uh, but I'll post that to Canvas, so if you want to review this. The last thing I want to talk about is Android development. And Android is written, there are other languages that you can use in Android, but uh, Java is one of the languages, and historically that was the first language. So let me look for an anatomy of an Android app. Tell you what, let's look for an example Android app.
Let's look for the Hello World Android app. All right. You can use Eclipse for this, or you can use Android Studio. Eclipse is kind of out of favor with Android developers, uh, and therefore uh, use uh, Android Studio. Apparently, you can use Visual Studio for some of these things, too, but I prefer to use like the native tool. Um, there's a whole bunch of files in an application in an Android app which gets to be, in some respects, confusing, but the whole idea of breaking things down is a maintainability of it. And we can uh, change one component without damaging the other. Um, number one is, and notice they have the package listing, is your Java code itself. So there will be Java classes and typically these classes uh, extend some form of the activity class. An activity is when an Android app presents a screen for the user to do something on. You can have images in the drawable folder. Your layout, so the way your screen looks, is accomplished via XML. So you define XML, which is like HTML, with a different set of tags that contain all the different things that you want to create in an Android app. Uh, you then have values. Values allow you to do things such as create an app that's multilingual. So for example, there's a strings XML file. In that, typically you would place all of your, um, all of your um, string constants. And that way, all your labels, everything like that. And you'd refer to those instead of hard coding strings. So, uh, if you wanted to say hello, all right, on your app, instead of hard coding hello in your app, you would refer to a string variable. And then if you wanted to make a multilingual app, you could say, you could have that string variable in a strings file just for French language Android devices that said bonjour. Uh, in a Spanish one, it said hola, and so on down the line. So you could create that. The main activity file looks something like this. It's typically going to extend some form of activity. <coughs> but in this case, all this application does is it extends the activity. You typically code an onCreate event, which is something in the uh, ancestor. And you set the layout for the app to do what you want the layout to do. Let me see if I have Android Studio. I might be able to create a Hello World app real quick, and I do. This is fairly resource intensive. It is a free download. Yes. Probably didn't. Yeah. Yeah, what, what it'll do is I'll prorate it. Okay. So in other words, if you got 70 out of 70, then you get all 65 points. Okay. If you got, if you got the, just so the math is easy, if you got half, if you got 35 out of 70, then you'd get half of the 65, so you get 32.5. Unless I'm in a generous mood. If I'm in a generous mood, I won't prorate, and I'll just add that, and essentially you get five extra credit points. Or you have the availability for five. So it depends on how much I would good mood I'm in and how much math I feel like doing. Yeah. 
Usually, if it's the other way around, if it's under, I definitely prorate because that would be cheating you. That would like only be giving you a, a 95 available points, but grading you out of 100. Whereas if there's 105 possible points, a lot of times I just like add it up, and essentially you got five extra credit points. Okay, so this is, I think, the Hello World app, and we can look at some of the things for this. Notice again. We have our application. It extends app compatibility, app compatible activity. And all it does is it overrides this on create method, which simply says when the application creates, this is what I want to do. We have our Java code would go in here. This is our activity class. We have our resource file, which includes an icon. This is actually a um, vector drawing to do something, to do the icon, instead of a, um, a, a JPEG or PNG image. Oh, our layout, where we have, we can either view it as a GUI, which is no fun at all, or we can view the XML code. And notice XML is similar to HTML. You have tags that have attributes. A text view is, a, uh, is simply a, like a label in other languages. So we define the label. We define other things about the layout in the activity main. And then we have our string. So our application name is my application. The hello world unfortunately includes hard-coded the text hello world. They should have used a string constant to do that. That way they can make a hello world uh, in other languages. The interesting way you do that is you create things in, the lay in, in any of the XML files that you have, you can do what's called a resource qualifier. What a resource qualifier is, if, is if the Android device has this characteristic, use this file instead of the default. So I have a strings XML file. I could have a strings French XML file, and if it was set to French. I could have a strings landscape XML file, which means that if the device is in landscape mode, I have different values for the string, as opposed to if it's in portrait mode. If the screen density is greater than, uh, if there's higher resolution, I could have a different resource file, different images, and so on. So it really gives you the ability to customize the experience. But again, at the root of all this is the thing that runs the show is the Java code that we write in our Java classes. I encourage anyone to take the Android class. Um, it, it's a good class to have. Um, it's a good chance for you to work on your Java, you know, uh, practice Java, and to learn the Android framework. Because uh, a big part of the Android class is, again, practicing Java, but a big part of it is learning how to use it within the Android framework. All right? Just like you could write C Sharp code that does all kinds of things, but the trick there is learning how it works with the ASP.NET framework. All right, well, here you're learning how Java works within an Android framework. Questions about this? All right. Wednesday will be a work day, which means we will go directly to lab. By then, I should have some information about the final. I already posted some information about the final, but I should have some more specific information about what to expect the format to be and what's going to be on it and so on. So do come. Uh, there to work on anything that you still have to turn in. I'll answer any questions and I'll also answer any questions you might have about the final. So read the important end of semester announcement and be on the lookout over the next day or so for information about the final.